Hey everybody, this is Petey from the Spinner Rack, and today I want to talk about Harlan Ellison and some of his adaptations. Now, specifically, I want to single in on not going into too much on the one in the middle, which is a very cool uh, thing of um, illustrations by Serenko based on a um, Harlan Ellison story. And um, also talk about two adaptations that he had issue with. He had issue with um, the I Have No Mouth, I Must Scream ad adaptation in Harlan Ellison's Dream Corridor. And he also had issue with Demon with a Glass Hand. Um, one, the first one, um, I Have No Mouth, I Must Scream was done by John Byrne. The second will be done by Marshall Rogers. This video that's going out where uh, Harlan complained about Demon with a Glass Hand. This first of all was uh, Julius Schwartz, who's one of my oldest friends, who's an editor at DC Comics forever and ever and ever and ever, he's now the editor of Mary's. Did a series of science fiction novels uh, about adaptation of Larry Niven and Bob Heinlein and Bob Block and what that. And I gave him the original shooting script of my Outer Limits second Demon with a Glass Hand, which they've been showing down the hall. Uh, to do. It had additional material in it, it had additional scenes in it, it was much larger. And uh, Julie asked me what artist I wanted to use, and I said uh, uh, Marshall Rogers, because Marshall Rogers had shortly before that time done a really, really series of Batman comics. They had been absolutely extraordinary in terms of design, in terms of use of color, in terms of just interior dynamics from panel to panel. And I thought he would be perfect for it. Uh, and so he was, uh, he was hired to do it. Now, I've gotten conflicting stories about why it is not... I, I don't think it's particularly good. And with that said, let's talk about one that's universally that's thought of as cool, which is this illustrated portfolio of some of, of Harlan's classic um, story. Repent Harlequin said the TikTok man. And this is sort of, story is a, a, this, a thing that goes on between the TikTok man and um, Harlequin, where it's like this sort of a civil unrest in this sort of um, environment of, um, you know, like we really consider the same thing we saw like the sort of stuck in this time stuck world, right? So we have this, I'm just gonna go through some of these so you can see where they had the pictures, this cool quote, and then Harlan's story starts here in the second, in the, what would be, this is the third plate. That's out of order, Rex. So I'm gonna quickly fix it, right? So we have this, and this, I'm pretty sure, I believe, for Harlan Nelson, is a very cool adaptation of his work. It's, but at the same time, this is not a direct adaptation of it. This is taking some of the bits and then just drawing cool stuff, which is ultimately what Harlan Nelson wants when he has an adaptation. It's just having some cool imaginative stuff. Not someone looking at it and saying, I'm gonna take it and turn it into a comic book, right? So I'm just gonna go through these so you can see these gorgeous prints. And we can see Harlequin here. Pretty sure this figure possibly is the TikTok man or he would rather be known as the master timekeeper. And there's a discussion that happens between the two of them where the TikTok man says to the master timekeeper gets stuffed, but we ultimately don't see that in this adaptation, right? But who cares? <laughs> it's gorgeous stuff. And it gives you a mood of what is you feel is going on. So there's something repetitive, time, time out of order, piece, being pieces of a puzzle, all this sort of thing that's going on. Some of the stuff you've seen in, um, I think, V for Vendetta, and obviously in the, the Watchmen, that sort of thing. So seeing this is something that was, even just a story alone, is um, very cool. But um, you know, you have all this stuff going on in here. And we ended, that's the six plates. Very cool stuff. So I'm gonna quickly go through these other ones. Cause this one, there's video where um, Harlan 
takes <laughs> Marshall Rogers to task. And this is after Marshall's, um, what is it? Marshall did his Batman run. It's not really a run, it's possibly more an arc. But we consider it since it's so classic and so many of his other Batman pieces, we kind of put it all into one thing and say, wow, what a great run. But it was kind of arc and a few other stories, maybe like six to seven of them. And then a couple things with Danny O'Neill and a couple other things he did with Batman here and there. Now, he also did, since he was working with, um, who was it, um, Steve Englehart, he also did the Coyote. And he also did a character which was um, Scorpio Rose, which was originally Madame Xanadu. Now, this right here is a very cool cover, right? This is, there's only like, there's not a, that many DC graphic novels. He did a lot of prestige stuff. But um, this is basically the story that we see in The Terminator, which was kind of stolen by um, James Cameron, because this was originally in The Outer Limits. And this is the original teleplay. This isn't the sort of, um, this, is, this is what happened before, well, this is actually what they did, the original teleplay where it took place in a building. Whereas the Terminator, you see him on a run, car chases, all that. Originally, Harlan planned for there to be a car chase in uh, in this story. And they said it was gonna cost too much money. So ultimately they did it in the building. So we have ultimately, in my mind, when I got this, I was just happy to see more Marshall Rogers work. I've seen him on the Silver Surfer. We had a lot of cool stuff here. But one of the things that he doesn't do in this story is kind of go Starenko and just go abstract. And I'm pretty sure, and this is my opinion, this is possibly why Harlan had so much issue with this. But ultimately, this is translating the script exactly, getting most of the story in there, and it plays to, to um, Marshall Rogers' strength and actually utilizing his use of architecture. He's really strong on that, setting the mood and, and this sort of setting in the building. So even if you don't have something abstract, you got all these cool sort of things that um, that Marshall's doing in this story, adapting it. Now there's other ones that was done before, which were like straight comics, like the Marvel stuff. And I believe there was some Hulk stories and whatnot, possibly the Avengers story, but you have some cool stuff here. Some, and you can really connect with the story, the connection between these two characters, the actual person who's getting, he's talking to the glass hand, which is the robot connected to this man. And then I think it's Consuela and these other characters are trying to kill him, right? So I'm not just gonna give you that quick overview of this story, but it's ultimately in my mind, this is a very cool thing to have. Yeah, I would say not to listen to Harlan Ellison. If you're a fan of Marshall Rogers, this is definitely a key book to have. It's a lot of story here. So if you're gonna go, if he was able to sort of, you know, have like a, I don't know, like the same length as Dear Devil, Man Without Fear, maybe you wouldn't have to do so many panels. But we've seen this work. I've seen Steve Ditko use a lot of panels. Perez, definitely, when he was doing um, Crisis. So, so something like this does sort of work. And this connection between these characters, the emotion, that sort of stuff, it's all very cool, right? So since I also cover a lot of John Byrne stuff, Dream Corridor is during a period where Byrne was at Dark Horse. And one of the problems we have here is we have this um, inside sort of narrative thing where they kind of, he plays like the Greek chorus before some of the stories. But the difference between all these other stories here and Demon with a Glass Hand is that, sorry, not, not Demon, this is I Have No Mouth, I Must Scream, is that Harlan decided to put the original text right next to Burns' story. Now, when I think, and I'm gonna also go through because I'm going to just quickly go through here. I want to show you this book online because it looks a lot better when you look at it in black and white. But I'm just going to show you this stuff here. And I don't want to say... This is one of the issues where you see he had issue with it. So he's talking about it and saying for you to compare. 
and it's like that's almost shooting the story in the foot like you don't sort of <laughs> do that when when you compare it actually it does work there's some things that have to be trimmed but at the same time well, i'm going to show you one of the reasons why he kind of did this in my opinion so if you look at this you know there's a very depressing sort of story and then you know it's a lot of despair the scale is there but it's not really that sort of one of the things where people say today is cathartic it's a lot of harsh stuff but when we go to it we get to the end here and then there's another comment about the adaptation like saying here, now that's what I call a heavyweight adaptation, and right? And it's saying like this, he's going under the weight of the adaptation. So almost poking fun at it. Now I'm not getting the reference he means by saying that, but it's really counterproductive, right? And let's see, this is the, the main reason why I say, but besides looking at, the Harlequin stuff, which is just very abstract. There's also this cyber dreams, this interactive thing with the story that he had. And it has all these cool locales for these characters to deal with like a video game. That was a very depressing story. But at the same time, this has a lot of abstract, cool stuff like a video game that's going on here. And that's kind of what he wanted. I think that, I'm going to show something from the Burn site. I think um, they sort of gave Burn like eight pages to do an adaptation of it. And he did, he just did, I think, 24. He could get it done in 24. And he just sent it in. And then they had this reaction. But this video game shows you kind of what he was going for. Have these sort of cool locales, even though it's a depressing story where these characters are just put through all these terrible things and you know here's issue two i'm going to quickly but i don't want to stick to this because i think the print so see this here we go again we have him talking about it here and then we have the original text here right and say for your comparison for comparison that is kind of it really doesn't make sense to me but um i'll show you some quotes where you get to see, like, look at this. Look at all this text sort of translated into this eight pages of story. Like that, that's a lot to sort of put through. And it almost might need another, like I said, with Demon with a Glass Hand, its own space to do. But I don't want to keep going through this. I'm going to stop here and I'm going to show you some of the stuff online in black and white, which I think is way cooler because this paper is a little too shiny for that story, for the, the dual shade. So, so to continue this, um, I'm going to start here where I look at um, the pages online. Now, I'm first going to give you an overview. You should go to Comic Art Fans. Go to Comic Art Fans. This is a gallery room, gallery room with for um, Jim Warden's um, site because he had all of the burn stuff he's either selling or he owns. And Dream Corridor is one of the ones he has. His hair is John Byrne or Byrne, comma John. <laughs> I have no mouth, I must scream. Complete story. John Byrne adapted the classic Harlan Ellison story. It was published in the four issues of Harlan's El Harlan Ellison's Dream Corridor comic, published by Dark Horse in the 1990s. And this has the 26 pieces. So I was wrong, I said 24. It's actually 26 pieces. And here on this site, you get to see it in black and white with the treated dual shade stuff and the original art. So I just want to give you a quick overview here. So you have all of the original art on this, of this story. And then you go to the next page here, right? So that's that. Now, here we go. So. Here's a story. This is the same art that I've shown you a couple different ways. I showed you the printed page, and I showed you on the website. Now I'm showing you, I took the pages from the website, 
and I just down, put it to my desktop so you can see it. But you should definitely go to the Comic Guard fan site, the Jim Warden page. He has a ton of gorgeous stuff there that you should check out. Right? So with that said, you know, here we have the story. It's glorious. You see the dual shade effect. Um, see this sort of thing. And it's, I mean, being displayed like this, I think that also there was color green. So it's like, I don't think that it shouldn't be colored. I think it should have been colored, but at the same time, something the same way OMAC was done to sort of bring out all these cool effects where you kind of lose some of this in what was printed, right? You see all this sort of thing and this characterization in, in, um, in all these characters. And you can see the dark sort of depressing sort of nature of the actual story where you see these moments where the characters had these moments of, you know, of, of happiness. And then of course of despair that's just food enough to keep them alive. And then it gets, as it goes, it keeps getting darker and darker. And as Benny is going up there, the, the character looks sort of like a monster. You know, Ted and Nimdok, they're not helping. And of course, Garrison gets upset because of, um, he thinks it's because of him having large privates. And then of course, the, um, Benny sort of gets, you know, it's just a really dark sort of story. And one of the interesting things I did on the web, which I don't want to use someone else's thing, but I should, I should sort of do that, is um, is um, play down the, the um, you know, sort of, um, the VO of this thing. And you see how much it matches to the story. But instead of doing something the way Byrne did it, I think he just wanted to have some cool locales instead of something that was set in some way where you feel trapped and claustrophobic and just feel like these characters are in danger on each page as you go along. Cause this is the same way the script is the same way this thing appears. So it's one of those things where I think they had that cyber version and he was kind of like, I want to see something like that where they go into these cool locations instead of trying to just try to say, hey, this is just a really kind of dark and depressing sort of story. And these characters that are just getting punished in every way, you know, every way known. So here it is. This I think is a, really a nice way to show this sort of art. So it kind of not the same as the Stranko thing, but you know, Byrne using all of his thing, you know, his tools to sort of get to that same sort of feeling of despair that's in the story. It's kind of a tough part of the story for me with the cans and they have all this ice. They can't figure a way to open up any of this stuff. And then of course, Benny goes crazy and that's where Ted sort of figures it out. He figures out what the beat, the beat Am. And now Am is the character who's the computer that's doing this stuff to them, but he's not actually in there. And I think Byrne also captured Am as the presence, even though there is the laughing and they describe the laughing. Um, sound like a, I think a woman or something like that. These sort of thing is not a character, but having that character, you know, Feel that character in this thing, even though you don't get to hear that character interacting. And then you hear this and the whole description of what happens, and at the end, you have that in there. So, it's um, something real powerful. So, in my research for this, I was looking for the article where Harlan complained about this adaptation, right? So it's on a couple of sites where they say it was Hero Illustrated issue 22. And um, it goes as follows. John Byrne wanted to adapt, I have no mouth, I must scream. And he did. 
But being John Byrne, instead of treating the story with not exactly reverence, but a certain fidelity to the material, because it's such a well-known story, John decides to do a John. If you remember the story, it takes place in the center of the earth, inside a giant computer, in the caverns and hundreds of miles of diameter. Well, John made it look like it took place in your kitchen. What I decided to do was run the actual story, a parallel amount of story for a parallel amount of pages on each issue. John's done it in four parts. And with each part, there's original story that is as published. The story appears on one side, on one page, and then there's five or six pages of John's art. In this issue, the text appears on page 14, and then you have John Byrne's version of I Have No Mouth that runs seven pages. The text that precedes it is a section of the original story that parallels what John's done. It's sequential art for what he's done next, man. Only you got two versions. You got, you got my version, you got his version. So with that said, seems like it's pretty cut and dry, right? No, of course it's not. If I go to the issue before that, issue 21, there's an interview with Harlan Ellison. So it's kind of odd because they asked um, Harlan what was his guilty pleasures. And he basically says he only had one guilty pleasure, which was um, the Spectre back when Michael Fleischer was doing it. Now all of my pleasures are grounded in good taste. Zombie, Next Men, Concrete, Sin City. These are the things I really enjoy. I haven't got any guilty pleasure in comics. So it was weird. So he was, um, I don't know, it's weird because there's also a past thing where he sort of critiques Superman or John Byrne run of Superman or just the idea of it, not really sightseeing. So who knows? So we go back to the note on the John Byrne board. As it was relayed to me by the editor, when the time came to try an adaptation of Mouth, Harlan said, if we could get someone like Byrne, that would be great. The editor said, how about Byrne? So he called, and on the base of this being what I perceived as a pretty prestigious project, I said, sure. Of course, then I discovered that fitting the story into 12 pages I had been allotted would require a lot of rewriting. That was something I discussed with Harlan over the phone. His contribution was no, which was how the adaptation came to be more than 12 pages. And then so the question was about the trade and not being in this trade. So ultimately, you have Harlan saying that um, Byrne asked to do it. You have Byrne saying the editor talked to um, Harlan about it and talked to Byrne about it. And Byrne thought it was a pretty decent, you know, a pretty prestigious project and said yes. So there you go. You have Harlan's words. You have the, <clears throat> the reason why um, Byrne went from 12 pages to 26. You have um, the idea that I guess before this, Harlan was interested, did like the stuff Byrne was doing, but for some reason he disliked that. And I've only given the opinion that he kind of wanted to be a little more um, tossing out sequential art and going, as I said, going Steranko like that um, adaptation. So that's about it. Um, still thinking about doing another video where we put John Byrne's pictures with voiceover and music using, but that'd be using someone else's video. So, um, so there's a couple of nice ones that really capture the voice in the dark period of that, that story. I really like to show you how it reflects because I kind of did it on my own. I was like, wow, it kind of gets all the pieces in there. But that said, check those out. Paul Nelson's Dream Corridor, I think there's about five issues of it. There's a collection that doesn't have the John Byrne piece in it. Um, I think they added the Rock God in there. I think you also have, um, you know, I said, Dean with a Glass Hand, the um, graphic novel from DC Comics. And if you go on eBay, you can get Starenko's uh, Repent, Harlequin said the TikTok man. And you can um, check out all that stuff. So, so, or online, I think you can see some of the plates of um, the TikTok man online. So, Spinarak out.